introduce formally everyone to the uh, webinar, how to deliver a customer experience across all channels. I think uh, is a, a big problem a lot of people are facing. And delighted to welcome uh, our speakers today. Uh, delighted to welcome back Martin Hill Wilson from uh, Brain Food Consulting. Uh, Martin, welcome back. To Thank you very much. Uh, we probably must have done over 30, 40 uh, of these webinars. Feels like it. Yet, so. Feels like it. Uh, uh, so delighted to um, welcome you back. And uh, also delighted to welcome Jamal Lear, who's uh, our VP of Customer Success for uh, New Voice Media. Welcome to the uh, webinar today. Thank you very much. Once again, thank you for inviting me. It's uh, my first uh, of these webinars, so it's quite exciting uh, to be here. Um, so I, I've been with the business for about uh, 10 months now. Um, so my, uh, my function really looks after our existing customer base. Um, and our focus is, is really around ensuring that customers are getting maximum business value out of the platform. So it's really about aligning um, what is a very rich uh, set of uh, capabilities and functionalities and kind of focusing in the areas uh, that are most valued to a particular organization. Excellent. And if you'd like the chance to meet with uh, Jamal and with uh, Martin, uh, a good opportunity to do that would be at Cloudfest uh, London, which is the um, New Voice Media, is that your annual, big annual event? Um, I've been there a number of times over the uh, years, it's always a good uh, event. Uh, Tuesday 20th of November in the Langham Hotel. And if you want to register for it, there's a link there, which I think Rachel will also put into the, uh, into the or Charlie will put into the chat room. Um, so if you want to watch uh, a replay, that will be available uh, later on, probably in about two hours time, callcenterhalper.com recorded webinars. I know a lot of you do like to share those with your management team. Uh, there's a very active discussion starting to uh, emerge in the chat room. That's at callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat. You do need to open that up in a different, uh, in a different browser. Um, so if you just type that in and then uh, you can have the webinar slides running on one side of your screen and on the other side you can have the, uh, have the chat room. Uh, and uh, there's a, an advantage of being in the chat room is that you can download webinar slides. So you can click uh, click on this link here, download webinar slides, and you can get a copy of Martin's uh, presentation. Plus also, I think, joining details for the uh, uh, for the CloudFest festival as well, uh, uh, conference. Um, and uh, if you're in the chat room, we want to ask a question, hashtag uh, question for a question, or hashtag tip for a tip. And there is a bottle of champagne or a box of chocolates for the uh, best tip. So um, we do send out quite a lot of champagne and chocolates uh, all around the world. So uh, always worth winning. Like to do it. Yeah, so quite a good chance of winning on the, on there. No number of people in the audience have uh, already won a prize over the uh, over our work webinar webinar schedule. So um, before we get it back into it, I think we're going to start off with a poll, which says, "Is consistency?" Uh, an explicitly stated goal in your customer service strategy, particularly since we're going to be looking at um, at uh, customer, you know, at uh, consistency as, uh, on service. So, I'd just like to uh, ask a question: Is consistency an explicitly stated goal in your customer service strategy? So, let's just see where the uh, votes come through. So, what's um, our guess? Well, I think it's going to be. Uh, on the on the low end. On the low end. I, I, I yes, I would I think so too. I'm thinking maybe sort of around the twenty percent mark, something like that. Hmm. 20, 20 to twenty to twenty five percent, I think. Okay, well let's have a look at the results. Oh my uh, it is almost the uh, other way around. Too pessimistic. We're better, so, uh, we're better hand over to the audience to present. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got sixty eight percent say yes, thirty two percent say no. Though there is an element of self selecting here. That people are interested in consistency would be coming to a webinar Indeed. on consistency. We're looking at so, advanced uh, users. Uh, so some uh, some quite interesting. Uh, that's good news. That's good. Quite interesting that's great. approach. There. That's great. So, so that's probably quite a good time now. Sample size on that was uh, 78. Okay. So probably quite a good chance now to uh, hand across to Martin. Yeah. And Martin, if you'd like to take us through some of your thoughts on. Um, on how much sure. to uh, deliver consistency. Be delighted. Thank you very much, John T. Um, so, thank you, everybody. Looking forward to uh, having our chat. Um, let's just start off. So, we're talking really about the consistency uh, of how we deliver customer experience uh, in the context of customer service. 
Um, and I suppose the first scene setting point to make uh, is that we do now live in a different kind of a world, uh, a world which has got much greater complexity to it, uh, which is really driven probably by the recognition that certainly, as far as our customers are concerned, we are generationally um, orientated towards certain ways of communicating. Um, there's a great Ofcom slide that I've got, not included here, but mm -hmm. it shows the distribution of which app would you most be upset with losing on your smartphone? Mm -hmm. And it's organized by, again, you know, the 16 to 25s right the way through the classic generations. And it shows almost exact opposites between email and messaging, which is interesting. Um, so if you were an email vendor and you were looking to your 25 year plan, it would look bleak <laughs> because simply the 16 to 25 year olds, I think 17% only would be upset. But if you said, what would you feel like if messaging was taken away? It's like 85% and it sort of goes mm. in, a, in, a, in a flip kind of a way. Um, and, and so part of omni-channel design is recognizing the preferences that you've mm. got as far as that's concerned. So um, unfortunately, that introduces more complexity from our point of view as the organization, especially is if, uh, as we have tended to do in customer service, by point solutions. In other words, oh gosh, we're now needing to address email. Oh gosh, we now need to address chat. Oh gosh, messaging has turned up. Oh gosh, social has turned up. Uh, and that's made life very difficult. Um, and so part and parcel of us getting our heads around of this strategically, um, both as a technology and also as a strategy, is to try to simplify our uh, thought process around of what we're attempting to do. Because also, I don't know where people sit on this, but I have generally observed that there are more channels rather than a pure substitution. Mm. Although we often have it in our design, that we'll get rid of that channel and introduce a new one. In reality, we end up serving pretty much a broader spectrum. Mm -hmm. And so it's useful to think in simple terms of mo modes of communication, of which there's voice, text, video, we are experimenting with telepathy, but it has not yet turned up mainstream. <laughs> so we will wait for that to appear on the R&D roadmaps. But essentially, you've got the three ones there. You can deliver that in three ways. You can deliver it as live assisted service using people. You can deliver it as self-service and proactive service. And in the chat room, we've already had a number of people talking about their drive towards chatbots, self-service, etc. Um, I haven't yet seen anybody specifically mention proactive, but again, that often suits the five generations of customer expectation, which is that, quite frankly, I'd like you to recognize my need before I need to phone you. Um, and just look at the options that we've got. Um, again, you know, we can communicate as advisors over voice, over video. Somebody mentioned earlier on in the chat room that they've got visual IVR now, and you can see that posted there. You look at the middle block there, the, the richness of different ways of communicating via text, I would argue are essentially all about getting there quicker. You know, letters take a period of time, email, although technically they don't need to, have also got associated SLAs of at least a day, haven't they, if not a number of days. And then you've got the so-called real-time communication around things like SMS, chat, uh, RCS, which is, a, which is a flavor of messaging, uh, and of course, social uh, traditionally came to the to the rescue as being a channel of, of, of outreach when we couldn't get satisfaction fast enough on other channels. So mm -hmm. a very rich one. And then if you go to the right hand side of the page, again, AI and cognitive services are beginning to pop up. Um, we're beginning to see some versions of augmented reality turn up. You know, you can you can, for example, test things in terms of does the sofa fit in the corner? IKEA has been doing some of that kind of work. Uh, and we're beginning to do some of that self-diagnosis. And of course, we're not just delivering and accessing that over traditional devices, laptops, or even smartphones. You know, we can speak into, into speakers, as we well know, with Alexa and Google Assistant. Uh, we're not too far away from things in our environment, such as speakers and heaters and TVs and stuff, being able to engage interactively with us. Now, if you look at that in terms of customer service leadership, that is quite a complicated environment now in which you are trying to deliver that stated goal in your strategy of consistency. In fact, that is extremely difficult to do. Yeah. And, and if you really get to grips with that and you get to grips with 
it is likely to increasingly become complicated servicing that generational need, then you really have to focus upon some of the tricks uh, that it's going to take to get that good. So that's the scene set. The other scene set to say is I don't think that this is anything that we are not recognizing in the industry. Here's a um, piece of research done this year across a number of territories, UK being one, I think Australia, America, um, Canada, I think, were the other were the other areas. And there were just three parts of this um, question around of what topics are most important for your customer service departments in 2018. Uh, three areas which people identify that I think is useful for our debate. One, delivering an effortless customer experience. And I would say that, that is probably the number one based on what we've just said. Mm -hmm. We all recognize that an omni multi-channel environment is complex. We recognize customers don't want that complexity in their engagement. Mm -hmm. They want simplicity. And that word effortless, frictionless, whatever we want to call that, is absolutely top of the tree. Um, here's the same version for me, a seamless omni-channel customer experience. I think that speaks to the same uh, priority. And of course, the other thing which matters a lot um, around of the, the, the effortless theme is that if I choose to come in on a channel, I expect to be able to resolve my issue on that channel. And there is still far too much, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Let me send you to my colleague who can. Uh, and of course, that's very much counterintuitive. It costs us money as a brand. It wastes your goodwill and time as a customer. So again, if we bring those three things together, it seems to me that we recognize anyways as an industry that we have an issue there. So that, that ties in with the point that uh, Brian has made in the uh, chat room. He says, um, here's a tip, map the customer journey, measure customer effort at relevant touch points, and then use mystery shopping to find your top frictions, and then look to reduce your your frictions, I guess, frictions. 100%. 100%. So, uh, and for me, that's foundation work in order to be able to design a, 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 an effective omni-channel strategy. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. No, I was just, just going to say on those graphs, it, it, it really, in my mind, sort of boils down to consumer choice or consumer-driven decisions. Yep. So, you know, don't force a customer to jump between channels in order to solve things because there's different banks of agents have access to different material and mm. um, different answers. But if a customer chooses to hop between channels um, during their journey, mm. then allow them to do so. So yeah. I think it's around it's around supporting what the preferences are of consumers as opposed to kind of driving their journey for them. Yeah. And that's an interesting balance that, again, I think I'm sure all, everybody in the audience has been part of an internal debate. What's the balance between allowing customers choice, which gives us more of an issue, and us trying to drive our agenda of making it cheaper and more effective. Um, and who gets to win on that? Uh, and it's interesting that if you get your philosophy in a certain way, you're always going to be competing against the customer who will probably win out. But if you strike your philosophy correctly, which for me is an outside in one, yeah, design it to be better than what you had before, design it to work for the customer, you'll probably end up in a win-win situation with regard to your priorities and that at the end of the day. But let's move on to the next but in terms of our scene setting. Um, I still think that there are a number of things internally around organization that mitigate against consistency and a low effort experience. And I'd just like to highlight some of these and, and suggest uh, if you are trying to improve that this is certainly an area you take away and you debate with your colleagues and question some of the ways that you are traditionally organizing yourself. Um, the first one being, it is still quite prevalent for people to have different owners of channels. Um, I own voice, I own chat, I own digital, which might be chat and social, I own social. You might have the divide between I own live assistance and I own self-service. Um, and of course, separate ownerships often imply uh, only being concerned about the remit that I've been given. Uh, I can think of two or three clients I'm working with where that is the case. They're conscious of it and they're grown up people, so they do collaborate, but it's not supported by the organizational structure as such. Uh, and if you are in a competitive environment and a race to the bottom, then you can easily have friction between that fact. You've also got this other one, which I would just like to stomp on. I was talking with Mara earlier on about this point, digital versus voice. I would like to say that I think digital is the most single unhelpful language that we can possibly use, whether it's attached to digital transformation or indeed going digital customer service. And the only reason I say that is that if you want to get 
into the debate, voice is digital as a technology. It's SIP, it's VoIP, we know that. So what does digital mean? What we really mean is things like chat and email, online basically. And by the way, email can be bounced between being legacy and new. So it's not a very useful language, and I would ask you to think about your use of digital. I personally prefer to have omnichannel as our frame of reference, because what it does acknowledge is that you are going to have both automated self-service and also live engagement. And it's the blend of those two worlds that leads to more cost-effective and higher value engagement. Um, if digital is all about taking cost out, you're always going to have tension between those two worlds. Anyway, I think, just to, just to weigh in on that, I think part of the reason that that, that language is used, that distinction is there, is probably, probably the fault of the vendors. Yep. You mm -hmm. tend to have organisations such as NPO who traditionally are focused on voice, and you have other vendors who are focused on online. So the fact that there are a few vendors that, that kind of try and do both, I think that's why this separation has remained it is. in existence and I, violence. I agree, yeah. I agree. And it's been a way to distinguish, we are everything other than voice, therefore yes. we are all digital. Correct. I think we need to move on from that. Uh, teams across sites, particularly when teams, we just do voice, we just do that form of engagement. That doesn't help in terms of coordination. There is also a real issue around of in-house versus partner. Um, and, and those, for me, are all symptomatic of the fact that still, I know people at the top of the hour said, oh, we do consistency in our customer uh, strategy, but I still come across many organizations that don't really have something that is formally thought through and formally communicated. I know they might have an idea mm -hmm. about it. And you need to really have in today's world a formal contact strategy that has linked the channels, the point that was it earlier on was making about uh, uh, Brian, Brian, thank you. Yeah. The points about journeys um, and also understanding the, the generational preferences of customers through voice of feedback um, and linking those all together. So there's an overarching strategy so that when you do have people focused on different channels or different modalities, it's within a overly orchestrated way of looking at life. And would you say that um, kind of the offshore model, I think the temptation is to offshore um, channels such as chat yep. traditionally, yep. whereas to keep voice perhaps onshore. Yeah. Um, so have you sort of observed, I know that I have, so the geographical separation there inherently kind of puts in certain divisions in terms of yes. a unified strategy. And if you then link the journey back and say, gosh, actually what's happening is my customer is starting on a third party search site. They may well come to one of our properties initially to look they then may find themselves talking to somebody who's physically sitting offshore, only to then be transferred to an onshore capability. That's quite a bumpy journey and quite difficult to coordinate all of those different elements. Not impossible, but you need to bring all those people together and A, make the point of you all belong to one experience and B, we're all operating under the same terms of reference. And again, that's the kind of thing that we're really talking about here. So recognizing that organization can be a huge challenge and it's an area for investigation and really trying to get it aligned and harmonized as best you can that's that's the first point to be made um so part and parcel of that i think is 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 defining what you are trying to achieve here um so what are you trying to achieve for me my definition of an outcome an omni-channel outcome is an engagement experience that works in any given customer situation um, and what I'm trying to encapsulate there is that it can be in any context, it can be in any, any, literally any situation for both you and customer, and yet it has worked according to what matters to the customer, what matters to the brand. That's a very high bar, by the way, I'm setting there, but it, start, it puts into relief all the challenges that you're going to go for. Now, you might not like that one, I don't mind, go and workshop it and get your own. But my point is, figure something out and use that as a point of reference. It is no point just buying technology and saying you have a contact strategy. That, that is not a strategy, that's just an enablement. Um, you need to think about what we're trying to do and what the outcome is. So I, I commend the idea of clarity on what your end goal is. So against that scene setting, how good are we? Um, well, I, I some of you have probably seen me talk about this before. I'm a big fan of the work that Eptica do, who annually run a mystery shop um, in the UK and um, they talk to 100 leading brands across most of the major sectors and what they're testing really is what we're discussing today which is the consistency and fluency of organizations as they use. Now in their particular example 
Um, they don't actually use the voice channel, which is a shame, really, but what they do include is web as a, as a point of access, social as a point of access, uh, email, and also chat. All right, so you've got those modalities sitting there, and they ask the simplest of questions, right? Which is, I've just given you four examples, but as you read through those examples, these are not rocket science questions. These are the most foundation type questions that you would be expected to get right. So in other words, we've set a low bar for those organizations to get a, a, an accurate answer out to them. And the point of doing it as a mystery shop exercise across those different channels is to see the consistency, even the availability of those channels and what results uh, are coming out of that. And I have to say, it demonstrates that we have still got some work to do. So comparing 2016 to 2017, then a number of channels have improved. However, we are still seeing a massive difference, if you want, between sectors. And put yourself into the customer shoe here. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a lottery in terms of how well I'm going to be served mm. in any given channel based on the fact I'm not going to research this, why am I expected to know? I just want it to work. And yet, even within one sector called electronics, the manufacturers, you know, are only half as effective as the retailers. Hmm. And yet manufacturers also rather fancy themselves in today's world of having relationships with customers. Yeah. And yet their ability to answer those questions across those particular, you know, those channels, they're not very strong at all. Um, is that because you think that the, the, those manufacturers have sort of outsourced their... I think it's B2B, B2B to B. Their connection to the retailers, so in a way they've outsourced yeah. the sales, so they outsourced the relationship. Well, indeed, but that's history. I mean, yes. the, the whole point is that manufacturers have woken up to being disintermediated and have said, we want a stake in the ground here, yeah. and we're going to you know, reach directly to customers. Apple, et cetera, being the, the yes. brilliant example. I suppose, you, uh, you know, I think I've got an Apple phone. I don't think I've got a John Lewis Absolutely. phone. No. Uh, you know, even that's where you know, the channel I use. So they've struck that point, yeah. uh, but they, they're not delivering in terms of really haven't got their act together around with that. Yeah. Um, you've also seen in that given period of time, uh, actually a number of channel uh, sectors get worse rather than get better. Um, and again, that's, this is just not the only point of reference. Uh, there is again some really good uh, US-based research, can't quite recall it right now, CX, which again is saying in the UK last year, CX standards declined. So mm -hmm. it's a dangerous thing in today's world for to see, you know, a tightening of the belt. I think I'm with the Institute of Customer Service. Or they have the same as well. Same, yeah. Yeah. So we're seeing a general point here as well. So, so with that as an overview, um, let's use a, a, a common definition of what does, you know, what does a good outcome look like in terms of how customers judge us. Now, this is something that Bruce Temkin talks about and it's something that Forrester use as well which is an advisory uh, organization. And they say, customer experience can be measured in terms of three elements, success, i.e. the outcome. Why did I communicate with you today? I wanted to know, I wanted to resolve X. That's what success means. Effort means, as we well know, how damn hard it was. And emotion is either what you flipped me into as a result of it being so damn difficult, or the natural emotion that is associated with onboarding versus the natural emotion that's associated with a complaint, for example. Incidentally, by the way, emotion, as you can see just from the numbers here, are probably the most influential of those three. Uh, and incidentally, um, John T mentioned that there's going to be um, at the Cloudfest the 20th. event on the 20th. And that emotion management is, is what I'm going to be running through. If anybody fancies that topic, then that's the next time that we're going to be talking about that in detail. But that's how customers judge us. Now, let's just go back to the fundamentals here and talk about outcome. You'd have thought that that's pretty much right in the center uh, and sweet spot of what we ought to be doing. <clears throat> but going back to the Eptica result, this is actually what's happening. Now, bear in mind, a lot of us think we're generally, as an industry, around about 70% first-time resolution. So somewhere between 15 and 70. Somewhere around there, you know. And by the way, people can accurately measure it tend to go, it's not as good as yeah. you think it is, it gets worse. But the interesting point on this piece of research is saying across those four ways of communicating, it's actually gotten slightly worse and it's under 60% now in reality. If you then up the standards and said, if we then look at the answer that we received from that brand and given the question, we think that was an accurate answer um, or not, that descends even further 
down to 44%. Now, assuming that that's been humanly done, which it was, across the 100 brands, which ought in many respects to be the leaders in their respective sectors, so mm. in a sense, this is a piece of research that should reflect best practice. What is interesting, and something that, again, you might put in the ground and say, are we better or worse than this, is that only 44% of brands are able to give a commonly accurate answer across their different channels, right? Now, that's one of the problems that we're sitting here with. Um, so you might have it in your strategy, but the, the next question is, operationally, are you delivering against that ambition? And the, and the numbers say we're not so good as that. So with that being said, let's have a pause point and invite our audience to debate that and to have a think. So we're going to be asking the question, do you have a regular organized approach to testing and improving customer experience and the consistency of service? So if you'd just like to uh, vote on that, uh, the answers are yes, no, or we're planning to. So I'd just like to uh, put that into the box. I, do you have a regular organized approach to testing and improving customer experience and the consistency of service? Any thoughts of... What do you think the answer is going to be, Jamal? I think it will be reasonably high. Uh, you know, I've, I've learned from my, my pessimism on the first one, but I think also the devil's really in the detail on this one yeah. because it's such a complicated thing. Um, I think, yes, it can be quite superficial, but yeah, I think it will be quite high. Okay, so let's share the results here. Sample size of 91. 56% uh, yes. say yes, 29% are planning to. And only 15% say no, so I think that's quite uh, quite good news overall. I would, yes, and by the way, it might be also in the way that I've asked that question. So I, I'm happy with that result. Can people, if you're on the chat room, reference particularly the second part of that question, which is maybe imbalanced. It was more to do with the consistency of service than improving customer experience, to be honest with you. So it's my fault there. But what I'm asking is, are you looking to check whether or not you're answering it in the same way across channels. It's the same service level, et cetera, et cetera. Some of the examples we're going to give in a second as far as that's concerned. Mm. If you are doing that, that's terrific. Please share with us how you're going about that. That would be really fascinating. Mm. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so if you, any answers in the uh, chat room for that, please. So um, we're now just going to do some uh, top tips and questions, have a look at what's been going on in the chat room. So we've had a, a tip in from uh, Susie. I like this one. It says different channels often have different owners. Uh, so if you yeah. want to make your consistent, your omni channel consistent, then you need to bring together the different owners of the different channels and uh, get buy-in from all of them if you're going to get everything joined up. Could I ask a question, Susie? How do you um, maintain alignment uh, amongst those owners? Have you done that? Have you done that through going? Have you done through that through metrics or just regular get together and calibrate? Okay, I'd be interested to see that from Susie. Uh, Angel asks the question, does it make sense to have a different approach based on channel? For instance, chat is uh, very informal uh, or is very informal messaging, first name, concise answers versus the phone channel, which could, could perhaps be more formal, Mr. Mrs. first name versus first names is different segments using different channels. Jamal, I, yeah, I think that's quite an interesting one. Certainly in, in kind of my, my time implementing uh, and kind of helping uh, organizations design these things, it was very standard that chat was considered the informal channel. Email slightly more, more formal because it's almost like an electronic letter. Um, but I think really you have to kind of tie it back to kind of how you want your brand to be perceived. You know, if you look at certain brands, you know, I guess innocent is quite, quite a good one. They've taken a very conscious decision to have a very kind of personalized, almost kind of quirky, cheeky, perhaps kind of informal yeah. engagement with customers. And they kind of have that regardless of what brand you're interacting with them on. Whereas if you look at, I guess, a more traditional bank, they're, they're looking at much more kind of professional um, or what we consider traditionally a professional kind of more formal engagement. And they may want to kind of keep that again consistent across the channels. So I don't think there, there is kind of one size fits all for that, but I think uh, you need to think about how you want your brand to be perceived. And, and perhaps marketing might kind of feed into some of those decision points. Yeah, so I think, I think consistency of branding, tone of voice if you want, um, and it can be modified according to the style of communication yeah. in channel. Yeah. I think uh, so. We've got an opinion in from Susie. She says, Be wary of multi skilling. Mm -hmm. For a consistent experience, advisors need to stay really focused. 
So how much we are really listening to what the customer actually wants. If advisors are constantly switching between contact types and channels, that might reflect in our latest survey. We've seen a, a slight decrease in multi multi skilling uh, in that. We've had a tip in from Izzy who says you should map all your customers uh, or your channels customer touch point and understand how they all fit together to form a consistent customer journey and fix any communication holes along the way. As different communication channels often have different owners, it's crucial to open communication channels in the organization and collaborate effectively yeah. between different departments. We've had a question in from Liv who says, uh, we have a divide in the call center team with reference to emojis and informal texts on our chat facility. Younger team members are keen to implement more experience, not so much. Of course, this is generational. What's your stance on this? So uh, Martin Jamal, have you got a, a, a thought? Um, test and learn. Um, so my quote for that is um, somebody who I heard present at RBS uh, about two years ago, and she said, we were rather uncertain about emojis and uh, banking and the seriousness of that. So we did test and learn, and we found a very, very clear feedback and outcome, which is everybody under 40 loved it, and everybody after 40 had a complete fail of humor about it and thought it was revolting, um, <laughs> and, 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 and a further indication of the bank going to to go into the dogs. So I think it's, again, a generational split. Um, bear in mind, by the way, why it exists. Um, if you think about the hierarchy of communication, face to face being the strongest, text being the weakest, emojis are an attempt to reintroduce what voice has natively in it, which is tone of voice. So it's another form of introducing emotional resonance it, it back into, into text based communication. So it does actually serve a function. <clears throat> and it has been massively popularized and in fact in messaging and the competition in messaging platforms the variety and strength of emojis is very much all part and parcel of the latest release it's mm. a competitive differentiator so it's not disappearing at all and it's an important component i don't think as customer service people we can therefore walk away from that mm. we have to decide how we deploy it in what circumstances and it's probably more to do with the nature of journeys and possibly to do also um, because bear in mind, messaging has done something very significant. It has brought together families around of family-based messaging. Yeah. yeah. So it's not true to say that your uncle or your granddad has never seen an emoji. They've been exposed to that. They're possibly mm -hmm. even pushing. I have a dad who's 93. He uses emojis <laughs> on the family messaging stuff. So he's familiar with it. But I think you've still got to be testing the appropriateness of when you do and you don't employ it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's... An incredibly divisive thing. I've, I've had hours of conversations with customers about whether to enable that feature or not in, in years gone by. And I think the safest thing to do is perhaps be led by your customers. Yeah. So you might you may just come up with something as simple as we're going to allow emojis to be used, but the training is if a customer sends an emoji to you as an agent, then you can reciprocate because you know that they're comfortable with it. But let the customer lead on the side of caution. And, yeah. and that usually is kind of a nice half point. Oh, by the way, I think it's, an angry, it's a, 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 a version of mirroring, isn't yeah. it? Of mirroring the customers. Uh, also, you should have an index of what emojis are meant to mean. Uh, ah, yes. <laughs> and you should have ones which are ambiguous, which are probably not used. <laughs> Good point. The, um, I've got a story on that one I can tell you about later. Um, uh, question right up your street, Martin. Mm. Uh, do we need to create a consistent, consistent experience in terms of emotion? Or do we need to focus on creating peaks in positive? This is quite an interesting one. So is it, do you need to be emotionally consistent or should it be you know, moments of brilliance? Well, I, um, I get the question. I would put it the other way around. I think you need to be emotionally congruent. All right, so um, in that sense, you're gonna be consistent. So um, if you, I think the most important thing as far as emotion management is concerned is contained in the notion of empathy. So you need to get onto the right wavelength, first of all. So if somebody's upset, you need to be appropriate with an upset person. If someone's happy, you need to be appropriate with a happy person. And then I think as much as possible, um, coming to the next point, you need to take people from whatever is a negative space into as positive as you can be emotional space. That doesn't mean that somebody who comes in feeling insulted and, and deeply irritated is necessarily going to leave you being overjoyed and excited. Mm. And, and quite often, by the way, there will be corporate policy, which means I can't give you the answer you want. 
Mm. But nonetheless, you can leave somebody with a feeling of their point of view has been listened to, respected, uh, and that they understand the reasons why we've said what we've said. And therefore, there is a sense that you know both sides have got as close as they can. So I, I think that the language I would use more about that is to do with that there is a congruency in terms of understanding the emotion rather than necessarily that you're always going for a, a type of emotion. I don't know if that helped, Brian, but, but emotional management is dead important. Yes. Indeed. Well, that's a pretty good time to hand back to uh, hand back to you, Martin, to uh, carry on with your thoughts about how to um, thank you. Uh, you know how to uh, how to uh, create the consistency. Yeah. Right. Good. So let's just. I think this should be okay. Right. So we discussed outcome uh, and discovered that we weren't, unfortunately, quite as good as we uh, need to be. Let's move on to the next area. And again, I think in the chat room there's a lot of people who are already on the ball with effort. But again, is an interesting. Uh, thing to keep investigating. And here's a couple of examples of what I consider to sit into the, for instance, of what consistency is about. Uh, one conversation by which I mean I as a customer don't really want to see any reason why I can't just keep having the conversation with you regardless of the channel um, and particularly of the channel over time. So for instance, many organizations have a social capability. The one I'm thinking of in this instance is banking, where it's not very easy to get much done on social, quite frankly, because it's all confidential. So if you look at most Twitter feeds for banks, they will say, sorry, can't do that. Please phone the following number, 0800. And it just looks awful, <laughs> you know, because I, the sense of it is, oh, gosh, I'm back at the beginning. I've got to start the conversation again. Now, again, what can you do to maintain you know, context and make it simple for people to do that? Here's another classic. You may be doing it in the contact center, but certainly marketing increasingly is sending out these one-way communications through SMS. It's been proven you know, to have high levels of, uh, oh, let's have a look and see what's being said there. But if I respond to that, I can't actually respond to those kind of automated SMSs. They're all no replies, aren't they? So let's say for the sake of discussion, I fire up chat. I still got to re-explain myself. Again, another example, email takes a couple of days. I'm too impatient for that. I'm going to fire up a messaging app. Again, why do I need to re-explain myself? And the data, the research does suggest that we do expect to be able to swap channels during conversation, not because you know we, we want to do it for our own sake, but circumstances change. Sometimes we just need to do that, but it's not easy. So again, can, are, are you aware in terms of your feedback the number of times that you are forcing customers to repeat the security of the ID and V, needing to re-explain, um, having to go through the business of having my situation you know, analyzed, gathered, recorded, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because that still strikes me as foundation stuff that a lot of people simply still do not get it right. There's still far too many stories I hear of real consumers going, and I had to do that again. It's interesting. So I think it was the uh, Harvard Business School. Uh, they did a recent study looking at, um, at the voice channel. Um, and it, they suggested that around 59, 60% of consumers who come in on the voice channel actually originated their journey on the website. Yeah. And I think, I think actually, if you look at digital traditionally, uh, that kind of context switching actually technologically is, is quite good. I think voice has kind of been left out in the cult to some extent. And if we look at kind of what we're, we're doing at New Voice Media in that area, um, we've got a technology called Journey Insights, um, which is designed to carry context from the website into the voice channel. Yeah. So that the point that the agent actually speaking to uh, that customer they haven't had to send them through an IVR or a visual IVR for that matter. Mm. They can actually see one of the pages they've come on. They can see Referio worlds, yeah. um, so that they can basically hit the ground running and mm. give the customer a sense that okay, this person knows who I am and what I've been doing up to this point. Yeah. Um, so it's incredibly important, I think. So on the technology, I mean, I think there's a number of must-haves. I think you've got to have a uh, unified desktop, mm -hmm. otherwise you're distracted. Yeah. You've got to have a unified inbox for the mm -hmm. different channels. And then the other thing you've got to have is that unified interaction history so you can see where customers have come from Correct. Yeah. Know, at the end of the day. And those, I would say, are absolutely on the shopping list. You might not get them this year, but you've got to have them soon because otherwise your advisors, by the by, are all, always going to be kind of catching up on the logistics of the conversation as opposed to focusing upon the emotional components of that. So you're absolutely right. It's, it's massively important. 
Um, the other thing, coming back to it, is which I really do think is probably symptomatic of stickies on <laughs> screens sitting with different team owners, is the number of times that we give the right answer out. And again, mm -hmm. um, I, I've deliberately given the the the, the, um, the year in which this study was done. This is 2006, 2016. Now, I know a lot of us hate something as ancient as 48 years in today's instant world, but um, it says that, you know, if, if I ask the same question over a couple of channels, only, only a quarter, it goes down to 8% over three, and nobody got it right over four. You go, yeah, that's 2016. It was so much better. Well, 2017, <laughs> there was a piece of research that said, yeah, 60% of retailers still weren't. Now, you can persuade me possibly that 2018 was a revolutionary period and we completely <laughs> changed, but I don't get that was the trajectory. So if you look at that, one of my points back to the, the, the previous piece of uh, the way everybody answered is, do you know as a matter of course, you have a systematic way of checking whether or not you're answering the same way across those channels? Have you got um, integrated curated knowledge management? Let's put it that way around. You know, And if you don't have a knowledge management system, because we all don't, and it sits in the head, it sits on the, on the stickies, how are you somehow calibrating and standardizing that answer? Because I'll tell you one thing, you go to three doctors, you get three answers. That's yeah, very true. Yeah, that's well, true. and that's an interesting point. So I'd be interested to get your, your perspective on it. I think as, as kind of self-service and online knowledge management systems get more sophisticated and you start to pick away at that low hanging fruit, I guess the, the nature of queries that are actually reaching agents are becoming more and more complex in Indeed. nature as time moves forward, which is why I measure things like AHT are probably not the way to go. But, but nonetheless, I think the point then, then becomes it's probably harder to give agents a prescriptive knowledge base in order to fulfill mm, quite, those queries because you've already done it up quite. front. So I think that probably plays into the, uh, the consistency because you're, you're relying on a certain degree of kind of human inference and, and kind of mm. human thought process. Mm. So, yeah, I, th I think that's kind of an interesting area. Well, I think, I think that's, a, that's a very good clue as an input to revising and upgrading your quality assurance program, mm -hmm. right? Which yeah. is not necessarily looking at, did I give the right, uh, you know, did, did that following thing happen, but investing development time in consistency of answer. Yeah. Uh, and I think on one of the previous ones, I, I shared a piece of research about um, uh, culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what kind of culture there is. And there was one called the network-based culture, which was the tick in the box one. <laughs> and that simply said, as we get end up with more complicated stuff in the live channel, mm -hmm. people are referencing each other's collective experience as mm -hmm. being the source of that knowledge. Now, that works perfectly well, providing you then you're consciously investing in calibrating that across people mm -hmm. to make sure the best answer will keep bubbling up. And that, by the way, is now just in the live channel. Mm -hmm. let's assume that the voice and the chat and the messaging teams are uh, accurate is that still in your self-service mm -hmm. and who's got the time to go check that so it's a bit more of a complicated question than you might imagine mm -hmm. people i know on self-service go in waves they will have a period where they put e-game they put inventor they put whatever whatever in place and get it up to speed sometimes they leave a librarian in charge but often it just decays over mm. time and yet knowledge as we well know is dynamic and always changing so in fact knowledge management becomes one of the key enablers mm. in a self-service and omnichannel consistency and yeah. i don't know many people that have really got it cracked it needs technology which is still emerging by the way to dynamically keep checking is everything lined up mm. we do also find other inconsistent service almost by design, if, for instance, if you phone a sales center and you say, is this your best price? You can often get a better price. If you, if you, if you've got a, a fault on, for instance, your satellite box and you phone a, a famous satellite retailer, they'll charge you a price. If you say, I'm going to cancel, they'll often give it to you, give you the repair for free. Funny world, so, that. which you don't get on the, which you don't get on the, on the website. So, yes. this, so there is almost some cases where consistency, inconsistency is almost built into the, built into the process, but that doesn't necessarily help the help the confused customer. No, it doesn't at all. No, no at all. So take take that one to heart about consistency. Uh, here's another one on service levels. Now I know this is controversial. We we said earlier on and, and implied that we might have different styles of language across channels. 
We also, I think, associate with that the fact that we should expect certain channels to be faster and not faster. Mm -hmm. Email is always a matter of days. But I, I learned in New Voice Media that it, actually you can change it from 24 hours to two hours. It's a perfectly competent technical channel. We just don't choose to invest in it being a, a, a quick one. We associate messaging with being instant. But by the way, the volume of messaging is so paltry relative to voice. I, I, I'm going to be very interested to see how good the triage and queuing is on messaging when it's got 50% of all live, which we're not nowhere close to yet. So at the end of the day, how what can the customer reasonably expect from you in terms of consistency of SLA, responsiveness, over different channels? And I would argue, why should I be having to second guess that? Why aren't we all trending towards a common standard and that should be increasingly towards real time at the end of the day? My, my perspective on that is um, I think consumers have been kind of educated over the years to expect certain things, as you were kind of saying, Martin. I think if you take email, which is kind of the, the outlier in, in the sense that that's the channel that typically takes by far and away the longest amounts of time, um, quite often people are sending emails through an online web form. Yeah. And what I've observed is that what people do is you fill out the web form, you submit the email, you then get an auto acknowledgement, which yeah. that actually then states the SLA. Yeah. Now, if that doesn't meet your expectations and your needs as a consumer, the first thing you're going to do is pick up the phone or get on chat. You've right. now created two duplicate contacts, yep. which then obviously has a load of negative impacts in terms of kind of handle times or the rest, because people are answering queries that they perhaps don't need to. So one uh, suggestion I would make is um, make it very evident up front before customers take the time to submit an email, which is going to take four yeah. hours. Yeah, yeah. And if that, if that is appropriate, based on the nature of their query, great. But have options there to say, well, actually, you know, if you're prepared to carve five or ten minutes out of yes. your day right here and now, here we go. Here's some live options. So I think it's about making it clear at the, at the front of the engagement. Brilliant point. And I, I would also say, as this gets more complex, we can't expect customers to know how to get around our service ecosystem. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of where's the, where's the manual that explains to me how to get my problem solved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what's the best channel for this? What can I expect during night time? What can I expect, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Educate me so I know how to use it effectively. Yeah, to, to your point. Absolutely. Brilliant. We've got a couple of questions though, to yeah, uh, please, dive please, please. into before, we, uh, uh, before we, we carry on. So um question that's come in from Izzy says, um, uh, it is standard to, to map a customer experience and measure it by use of hard metrics. For instance, uh, clicks to measure engagement, increase in sales, decrease in customer support. But how do you measure an, an emotion that your uh, channel creates? How do you measure customer experience from an emotional it's, point of view? It's, it's a great question and it's a difficult question to answer. I can I can talk from kind of the NVM perspective. So um, we um, we have a technology called Conversation Analyzer. Mm -hmm. Currently it's, it's focused on the voice channel, but next year that is going to transcend all channels. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, so you have a consistent analysis there. And the idea behind it is it's basically allowing you to QA up to 100% of all of your calls. So it's effectively um, speech analytics yep. mapped onto certain sentiments you might look for. Maybe mm -hmm. you're looking for things such as compliance, et cetera, et cetera. But that technology will allow you to get a, a sense of the emotions and the sentiments mm -hmm. that are happening, both from an agent perspective, the exhibiting frustrations, and also from a customer perspective. So I think we're kind of by like measuring how often your words are used, certain words, certain used, phrases, yeah. all that kind of yeah. stuff. And obviously the natural point from there is then to go into tonality and things like that. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of we start to move into sort of the bleeding edge of, of technology, but that's something that we're kind of really focused on. Um, so it's it's quite yeah, it's quite an apt question in our world at the moment. Indeed. And we've got a question in from Geraldine who so says, I want to digitalize the IVR. So I guess this is taking the IVR, uh, which is on the voice channel wants to make it into self-service and presumably wants some degree of handoff to different different channels bring the IVR from uh, you know more up to date and tied into the web channel any advice on the first steps to take um, well I, I think back to my previous point Geraldine I'm going go uh, um, search for visual IVR and see whether or not that's what you're looking for if not um, come back to either myself or, or anybody else on the panel uh, and re-ask the question. Um, also, let's not use the digital word because I don't quite know what you mean by that. Could you re-express the question in, in a non-D way? But I suspect what you're trying to do is to say if people still want to come through what was traditionally a voice thing but flip into other areas, 
visual IVR is one of the technologies that is doing that quite yeah. successfully. I mean, I would say, you know, if you were negotiating a self-service, uh, a web self-service uh, knowledge base, you would go through a type of IVR. So you would go through a query, a series of questions leading to answers. At that point, you should allow a customer to either get an answer online or maybe to pivot into, into mm. voice. But at that point, all of that context should come through automatically. Yeah, I yeah. think it's important that you don't ask a customer to, to then provide the information to allow the voice routing. I think it should be done once or right. once only. Right, yeah. right. So yeah. 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 behind channels. Might have okay, yeah. thank you. Um, so actually, just to that point, um, there you go. Oh, so very quickly, by the way, I, we're needing to chase time. So I'm just going to show you, by the way, again, from the Eptica stuff, uh, the difference between uh, two time periods in terms of speed uh, and in terms of accuracy. Um, and again, you'll be able to look at the slides later, but just look at the best and worst on performance across all of those in terms of speed, in terms of accuracy. The underlying message is it's a lottery. Um, so one of the key things is that ain't going to get cleared up in the next couple of years. If you want to be great as an organization, you could put the whole of your effort strategy under the label of consistency and just absolutely ensure mm. that you can expect what you can expect across any channel and promote the heck out of the fact that you're reliable in that way. And that will make you significantly different and better than the majority. Okay, so that's, I think, what I was just saying. Yeah, that's yeah. Here's another one, depressing, which is again, uh, comparing just one channel, uh, Twitter, uh, in terms of the percentage of accuracy of answers. And unfortunately, the red dots signify sectors that have lapsed uh, in a given year. Um, and then we're looking at that through the lens of speed. And again, you can see in a completely arbitrary way that what used to be quite good has suddenly become much worse. Why is that? And customers suffering from that particular point. So is that triaging? Is that under-resourcing? You know, lack of experience, trying to go much faster than you can, whatever, whatever, whatever. Fact is, customers don't know where they are. Um, to the point that we were making earlier on, we will increasingly see a world in which the blending of live assistance and self-service through chatbots, virtual assistants, automation, et cetera, et cetera, is going to take place. It's not an, it's not an either or world, it's a blended world. Therefore, escalation absolutely matters. And what uh, Jamal was talking about is intent and context needs to flow. Mm -hmm. from one situation to the other, regardless of your modality and or whether or not it's inbound or outbound. And I'll just say really quickly as well, um, frictionless is, is a good word at this point. So if somebody is in a chatbot, for example, and you mm. determine that actually the chatbot wants to move them into voice, yeah, the last thing you should really be doing at that point is have the chatbot present a phone number because the customer has the psychological barrier of making the call. They might have to negotiate sure. an IVR. Um, they may have to pay for the privilege of doing so. Much better for the, the bot to actually -linking. confirm yeah. what is the best number to contact yeah. you on and then make an outbound call yeah, yeah, automatically. Yeah. Absolutely. So friction is a really important thing when you hop between channels. So I, I would say that this is probably a, a, one of the frontiers of getting stuff right. This should be the brief for the service design mm -hmm. and it should be the brief from your quality assurance. It should be the brief from your mystery shopping. And you need to be able to measure this and report back on this because this is a key area. Uh, there's just an example. We don't spend much time. And by the way, one of the reasons for it is that chatbot tech is getting OK, but the business of not using a human to deliver an answer is going to take some time for us to get it right. And again, this, this data suggests again that we have some success, but not entire success through a single channel. You know this thing about resolution on a single channel? We're going to have to escalate to humans. So for goodness sake, make that as simple as we possibly can. Um, right, Lizzie has got a question. We might as well do that just very quickly. Oh, yeah, we've got a question uh, in from uh, Izzy. Uh, and uh, Izzy says, here, let's just get the, the screen up. Uh, what about third party solutions that allow for paid human testers who sit yeah. outside your business to check your channel on the fly and record a video of their uh, reactions? What's the opinions of such tools in measuring customer emotion and experience uh, with product and channel. I think the tools uh, is, is talking about things like user testing, user bob, user brain. There's a, a range of them. Yeah, I'll, and, uh, I'll check in very briefly on that one. I, I, I like the concept. I think it's a, it's a valid concept. I think you, what you have to be mindful and careful of is that they are representative 
of your consumers. Mm -hmm. So are they the right demographic? Yeah. Um, are they are they going to surface things that are genuine and a good reflection of the people who you're trying to test against? The other thing is all voice of customer is made safer by having multiple points of, 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 of answering. Yes, so if it's point. one source, in, in, in addition to actual customers, in addition to actual advisors, I think it's useful yeah. but for the points you've made. Context, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Also, I would, I would tend to go for functional as opposed to emotional. I think the emotional thing is much more difficult to outsource at this point in time because you've got, you've got to understand what you're going for. Right, we'll just go very quickly and then we're coming to the top of the hour. So taking all of that as a conversation, here's some suggested action points. Um, I would define consistency so everybody knows what it means. Um, I, I know what you know the word consistency, but what does it apply to? What aspects of your overall service have to be consistent? Um, define when it matters and how it should work. So again, I would redraw your customer journeys and say, this is an example of consistency, how we want it. Uh, put that right the way through, you know, from original induction right the way through to continuous improvement, coaching, training, blah, blah, blah. Uh, make consistency something you measure and set targets against and, and work out how you're going to collectively hold yourself accountable for managing its improvement. So back to the 58% of us that said we were doing it, um, how good are you right now? Can you tell me how good you are uh, in a measurable way? Mystery shop, all engagement paths um, to root out inconsistencies um, because it will apply in all sorts of weird things. IVR still remains a dark place for things to go wrong. Um, you know, make the obvious point, don't just analyze, fix stuff. Uh, and then really, because things that matter in this are things around of knowledge, tone of voice, anything really that going bump as far as the customer's concerned, spend time visiting, reading, checking other stuff out and have a real drive towards the elimination of those and being best practice as far as that's concerned. Um, and, and the last point is that that's hard work. Uh, it, it's easier to get stuff slightly wrong than always consistently right. Um, I commend uh, whoever's written this, um, and it might have been Richard Branson, but all the little details uh, are the things that take average companies to exceptional companies. Hmm. Um, and again, that's, that's a really, really important quote uh, about really obsessing about the stuff that makes the difference. Mm. In fact, they used to say that re retail was detail, but I think in in uh, in life, business is now uh, all about detail. Let's have a quick look yes. at, across at the uh, chat room for a few more uh, few more tips coming through. Yeah. So uh, here's a tip from Lorena who says uh, read, categorise, and classify root causes of negative scores. It's a oh, huge yeah. source oh, yeah. of. Uh, yeah, information. Great uh, Diana said, I believe you need uh, enough diversity on your team to be able to communicate effectively with yes. all the customers. I think it's one that we uh, sometimes uh, lose great. sight of. Uh, Lorena said, if you have an accurate uh, training plan plus continuous coaching, advisors can be perfectly multitasking on several several channels. I'd agree with that. So, um, I think it's you all need to about the, the training yes. and the organization as well as realizing that not, it doesn't necessarily suit all, all people. Um, and oh, Lorraine has put a lot of uh, comments in there. Several metrics should be considered. We uh, do have the metric, the basics such as CSAP, issue, issue resolution, average handling time, but we also analyze deeply yeah. uh, customer satisfaction comments yeah. and the root cause of dissatisfaction of yeah. uh, as well. So. Um, uh, we're reaching the top of the hour. In one or two words, what did you like best about today's webinar? If you could pop that, uh, type that into the chat room. What did you like best about today's webinar? Let's have a look, seeing who won the uh, winning tip. And this was sent in by Susie much earlier on. Different channels often belong to different owners. You uh, have to bring them together uh, to uh, get buy-in from all. Uh, to get a kiss, consistent uh, experience. So there's a bottle of champagne or a box of chocolates. We'll be contacting you after the webinar to see what you prefer. Uh, if you'd like to, uh, we've got a survey, if you'd like to complete that when you uh, uh, leave the webinar. And if you'd like a, a demonstration of the New Voice Media uh, software, in particular the Conversation uh, Analyzer, uh, though any of their other suite, uh, Conversation Analyzer is the one that can analyze emotion uh, on telephone calls. And if you want to meet up with Martin and with um, with Jamal, uh, then a great place for that is the uh, Cloudfest uh, event. 
uh, on Tuesday, the 20th of November at the Langham Hotel. We'll have the slides available probably in about an hour's time uh, and, the, and the replay uh, to be able to watch this. And we're back in two weeks' time where we're going to be looking at how to give customer experience to excellent customer experience to vulnerable people. Just like to say thank you to our two speakers. Martin, thank you for joining us pleasure. today. Pleasure. And Jamal, thank you for joining us thank for you. our first webinar. Absolute pleasure. And thanks to everyone in the audience. Thank and you. we'll be seeing you uh, again, hopefully in two weeks time. Bye-bye.